I'm in the very unenviable position of being a fan of Woody Allen's films. Now, I want to make that clear. I'm a fan of his films. So I'm not in any way justifying anything else he might have done, okay? Okay. In my opinion, one of Allen's most overlooked films is the 1987 picture Radio Days. Allen himself doesn't actually appear in this film, but he does the voiceover. The film is about the halcyon days of the golden era of radio, which Allen grew up in. At the end of the film, there's a scene set on New Year's Eve where the stars of radio go up to the rooftop and get locked out. And over this, we hear Woody Allen say this. I never forgot that New Year's Eve, when Aunt B awakened me to watch 1944 come in. And I've never forgotten any of those people or any of the voices we used to hear on the radio. Although the truth is, with the passing of each New Year's Eve, those voices do seem to grow dimmer and dimmer. And even though I don't care about that era and I wasn't alive for it, that line always kind of made me feel sad and nostalgic. Now while I started off this video talking about Radio Days and Woody Allen, that was just sort of my means of explaining that I too am affected by retroactive nostalgia and you know, I'm not pious or sanctimonious. Looking at the concept of retroactive fandom, there are so many places you can go. For example, the, the video game Lego Dimensions or the Kingdom Hearts series. So in order to make this kind of more simple, I'm just going to narrow it down to three films that came out last year in this order. Order, Ghostbusters Afterlife, Spider-Man No Way Home and Space Jam A New Legacy to kind of examine the concept of retroactive fandom. The trailer for Ghostbusters Afterlife was the catalyst for this essay. I thought it was really weird, I mean here you have a movie that's based on a franchise that's kind of been dormant since the 1980s but it's being advertised at children. The Ghostbusters franchise is kind of an interesting one to look at in terms of trying to bring back the franchise and the different audience it targets. For the uninitiated, Ghostbusters was a 1984 sci-fi comedy that was very well revered. In 1989 there was a direct sequel, Ghostbusters 2. And between 1986 and 1991, there was a cartoon series called The Real Ghostbusters. Now, as a brief aside, there was another cartoon series that ran for one season in 1997 called The Extreme Ghostbusters. But that was more its own thing. It was taking the iconography of Ghostbusters and the kind of premise and, and doing its own thing with it. So I'm not really going to count that one. The first attempt at rebooting the franchise was in 2009 with the video game Ghostbusters The Video Game. In the game you play as a, as a new member of the Ghostbusters as you go around exploring with the four members from the original two films. Clearly this was a game that was advertised at children who grew up with Ghostbusters back in the day who are now adults. In the 2010s a, a new division of Sony Pictures was created called Ghost Corps which had the intent of making a cinematic universe out of the Ghostbusters franchise. The first attempt at this was the 2016 film Ghostbusters directed by Paul Feig which was later redubbed to Ghost Ghostbusters answered the call on home release. Ghostbusters 2016 essentially just follows the, the beat for beat of the 1984 Ghostbusters film and establishes a completely new continuity and is aimed at new younger fans without regards to the original fans of the franchise. The film however underperformed at the box office so in 2021 Sony came up with a new way of trying to re-establish interest in the Ghostbusters franchise. This was in the form of a requel which is a, a portmanteau of reboot and sequel which establishes the reboot of franchise while also acting as a sequel to the films that came before it. See for example Star Wars The Force Awakens. This requel called Ghostbusters Afterlife completely disregarded the 2016 remake and just continued on the continuity of the first two films. The intent here was to kind of act as a, a passing of the torch, you know. It was to say like, okay, fans of the franchise from the 80s, you now give it to your kids. Now I didn't see Ghostbusters Afterlife in the cinema, but I did catch Red Letter Media's review of it when it came out. In that video, Rich Evans says this. Marketing like, money. our generation will not let our toys go. Ever. It's, it, you know, we, it's a, we're going to insist that our grandchildren keep playing with our toys. You had to they, like this because I liked it. They can't have their own toys. You need to play with Star Wars and Ghostbusters. There is truth to this. In Ryan Lazardi's book, Nostalgic Generations, he actually talks about how media is placating the Gen Xers. Meanwhile, every other generation to come after it has to kind of have a regurgitation of their media. 
The idea of multi-generational media has its supporters and detractors. Supporters claim that it helps you establish a bond between generation and helps with things like continuity and compassion, whereas detractors claim that it's bad for younger generations to have no distinct identity of their own and also it stagnates the implementation of new ideas. In Ghostbusters Afterlife there is a scene where Paul Rudd's character Mr. Gruberson is showing the new cast of characters the advertisements the original Ghostbusters placed in 1984. This is an example in a multi-generational film of what Ryan Lazardi calls the surrogate identity i.e. the generation from yesteryear are passing down their stuff to the generation of today. In his book Retromania Pop Culture's Addiction to Its Own Past, Sam Reynolds talks about how you know nostalgia for past eras isn't really a new thing. For example the Renaissance look to you know Roman and Greek history as well as the, the Gothics looking to medieval history but there hasn't really been a point in time in which we've had such an addiction to our own immediate past i.e. our own lived history. There's also this concept of the 20 year cycle. In the 1970s there became this nostalgia for the 1950s and the 1980s for the 1960s and the 1990s for the 1970s for the 2000s and for the 1980s and so on. But even in those decades even though there was nostalgia for what came 20 years before it there was still interesting things happening in music and fashion and art and literature and film that you know each decade has their own distinct identity but in the 2000s like everything just became so laden in nostalgia that it really doesn't have its own distinct identity. And now we're getting to the point where that decade is being reminisced on. Case in point, Spider-Man No Way Home. To talk about Spider-Man No Way Home, we have to understand the difference between text, intertext, and paratext. So a text is the work itself, right? The intertext is that work's relation to other works, and paratext is everything that surrounds a text that informs it. Um, I understand that that is still quite an abstract idea, so to kind of solidify a little bit, I'm going to use the example of this copy of Don Quixote. For reference, this is the 2005 vintage edition with the English translation from Edith Grossman. Now, the text itself is what you're buying the book for, the, the adventures of Don Quixote de la Mancha and Sancho Panza. But when you buy the book, that's not all you're getting. For example, when you open the book, the first thing you see is two little paragraphs. The first being um, the biography of Miguel de Cervantes, the, the man who wrote the book, as well as Edith Grossman. And the, the person who did the translation. Beyond that there are two forwards in the book. One is from Edith Grossman herself where she, she basically talks about how she got into translating and how she ended up translating Don Quixote and, the, and the, the troubles that came from that. And then the other forward is from Harold Bloom where he talks about the, the cultural significance of Don Quixote and how it influenced all the literature that came after it. And then even in the book itself there, there are footnotes from Grossman where she explains some of her reason for translating the text the way she did as well as you know some of the cultural references that may have been lost in the process stuff like that that's all paratext that's all you know informing the, the, the book itself, it's, it's giving you the greater sense of what's going on. But there's also an example of intertext in the book. For those who are unaware of the story, Don Quixote is about a man who, who loses his mind from reading too many books and, and can no longer discern between reality and fiction. And he, he envisions himself as the protagonist of a picaresque adventure. In the book itself there is a scene where Don Quixote comes back from his first misadventure sick and dehydrated and his daughter seeing him in the state freaks out and calls the local priest to come down and burn some of his books which have influenced him this way and in the scene the priest goes through Don Quixote's library and has to decide which books to burn and which books to preserve. And Trueta Cervantes is, is referencing other Spanish literature at the time and they're, they're just saying what about this book oh burn that what about this book preserve that that's intertext that's don quixote's relation to other texts so now that we understand paratext text and intertext let's look at spider-man no way home spider-man no way home is always going to be intertextual due to its relation within the marvel cinematic universe which are a bunch of films that all tie together. I think the only film from the Marvel Cinematic Universe that you can watch as a standalone text is probably the first Iron Man. Everything else requires knowledge of the other films. For example, in Spider-Man No Way Home, you can not watch that film without having seen Doctor Strange because he's such a prominent character in the film. There's no way to watch Spider-Man No Way Home without having seen either the Sam Raimi or Mark Webb Spider-Man films. You can technically, but so much of it is lost. That's because Spider-Man No Way Home 
film requires intertextual knowledge of two separate screen adaptations of Spider-Man which began 20 and 10 years ago respectively at this point. The film's paratexts, the trailers and posters which inform it, put huge emphasis on the villains from those films returning for this one. Your enjoyment of the text is therefore contingent upon your knowledge of those texts, requiring people to either revisit those films or visit them for the first time. Here's a comedic illustration of this in effect in a video from Canadian YouTuber Ryan George. So check this out, I was thinking we get Andrew Garfield to come in as Spider-Man from another universe. Oh, yeah, I mean, he's great. Okay, I was expecting a bigger reaction than that, but also we get Tobey Maguire in as Spider-Man too. Good actor, sure. They both played Spider-Man before. Oh, did they? Yeah, in other movies, they- Oh, I don't, I guess I missed those. I... Really? I mean, I have no recollection, but the movie will still work, right? Okay, now, you know what, sir? I'm gonna need you to go watch five Spider-Man movies real quick, okay? Oh, really? Yeah, the impact- none of this is gonna land the way I wanted to if you haven't watched those five movies. Five movie- okay. So, what did you think? Yeah, you know, I mean, some of that was great. Okay, now listen to this. I'm thinking we get Willem Dafoe back as Green Goblin. Oh, he's from the first movie! Oh, there's the reaction I'm going for. Oh. Andrew Garfield and Tobey Maguire's appearances in the film were not given out before its release, and it was up to all audiences to see it for themselves. Here's an example of an audience reaction to Andrew Garfield showing up in the theatre. <laughs> ah! <laughs> Meanwhile, here's the same scene played at home. It's okay, it's okay, I'm a nice guy. <sighs> okay. Who the hell are you? I'm Peter Parker. There's this like really awkward like pause, you know, like for applause where upon watching at home, it's like watching a, a laugh track sitcom where, you know, they forgot to add the laugh track. Garfield's performance in the film is what we're going to take away from this because the films he was associated with were quite maligned. The first Amazing Spider-Man film was seen as just kind of derivative of the original Spider-Man film by Sam Raimi. And the second Amazing Spider-Man was absolutely annihilated because it was an incoherent mess of tangled plot lines that didn't really go anywhere. Despite the initial apathy for a series of films that were admittedly only created for Sony to preserve the rights to the Spider-Man character, there are now calls for an Amazing Spider-Man tree after Garfield's appearance in No Way Home. This re-evaluation is another example of retroactive fandoms. A similar thing happened with the Star Wars prequel trilogy of films which were disregarded initially but gained retroactive fans as a result of prequel memes. Memes which used scenes from the Star Wars prequel trilogy for comedic effect which resulted in people revisiting the films and becoming fans of them. Lastly I want to talk about <laughs> the new Space Jam movie. Space Jam A New Legacy is not a film. It takes a brand name from a film from 1996 to make a two hour long advertising for HBO Max in an attempt to create retroactive fans for not only the Space Jam franchise but for many Warner Brothers franchises. The film uses a tin narrative to justify hopping from one Warner Brothers IP to the next to engender children to their back catalogue. In many ways, Space Jam A New Legacy is retroactive fandom taken to its logical conclusion. It's not even really concerning itself with making a coherent text, instead focusing on throwing every franchise under its belt at the screen to see what sticks in an attempt to milk their existing franchises for multiple generations. Hufflepuff, I know it! I think about what Sam Reynolds writes in his book and at one point he argues that the, the pop culture of the western world is kind of dried up and we're all just kind of regurgitating the same text and reference points and in his book he insinuates that the next interesting thing is most likely not going to come from the western world, uh, it's probably going to come from Asia or Africa or Latin America and I think there's some validity to that, I mean one of the most popular text from last year was Squid Game, the Netflix series from South Korea. In some ways Squid Game is, is, is quite derivative of like Battle Royale. Um, so even then there's not a lot of originality on display but there is an interesting premise, there is a, a good critique of capitalism in it. There is some very distinctive iconography in that show alone that is very distinctively Squid Game. Now that franchise will probably get milked to death in 10, 20 years too. But I don't think the, the well is dried up in terms of creativity and I personally would prefer to see kids of today having their own distinct content. And if content is to be made that's nostalgic, I would prefer if there was an actual purpose or premise to it to modernize what 
at one point was an interesting concept that simply failed, that fell flat for whatever reason, instead of just regurgitating everything from yesteryear. Do you remember? Do you remember? Do you remember?